Okay, so for those who haven't met me yet, I'm Felicia, and I'll be reading the Bible passage for us this morning. Um, so that's Jeremiah 29, verse 1 to 14. Jeremiah 29, verse 1 to 14. Okay. This is the text of the letter that the prophet Jeremiah sent from Jerusalem to the surviving elders among the exiles and to the priests, the prophets, and all the other people Nebuchadnezzar had carried into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. This was after King Jehoiakim and the Queen Mother, the court officials and the leaders of Judah and Jerusalem, the skilled workers and the artisans had gone into exile from Jerusalem. He entrusted the letter to Elisa, son of Shaphan, and to Jemariah, son of Hilkiah, whom Zedekiah, king of Judah, sent to King Nebuchadnezzar in Babylon. It said, this is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says to all those I carried into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Build houses and settle down. Plant gardens and eat what they produce. Marry and have sons and daughters. Find wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage so that they too may have sons and daughters. Increase in number there, do not decrease. Also, seek the peace and prosperity of the city to which I have carried you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it, because if it prospers, you too will prosper. Yes, this is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says. Do not let the prophets and diviners among you deceive you. Do not listen to the dreams you encourage them to have. They are prophesying lies to you in my name. I have not sent them, declares the Lord. This is what the Lord says. When 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will come to you and fulfill my good promise to bring you back to this place. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. Then you will call on me and come and pray to me, and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. I will be found by you, declares the Lord, and will bring you back from captivity. I will gather you from all the nations and places where I have banished you, declares the Lord, and will bring you back into the place from which I carried you into exile. This is the word of the Lord. Well, good morning, everyone. It's good to be here to uh, get stuck in the Word again. So keep your Bibles there at uh, Jeremiah 29. We're going to be having a look at that this morning. Uh, my name is Matt. I'm one of the pastors here. So good to be here. And, uh, uh, you know, out of that question about uh, being an optimist or a pessimist, uh, I definitely fit way down the end of the optimist end of the spectrum. Now, a quick survey here amongst uh, CPUs. Uh, who who's self-identifies? Yep, you are an optimist. You are an optimist. Okay, okay, a few. What about pessimists? How many, how many kind of put themselves down the pessimistic end? Wow, I think the pessimists actually have it. Well, that's, that's probably saying something about us right there. Now, uh, optimism. Now, it's, it's an interesting thing for me as a, as a real optimist, and I'm married to someone who's a little bit more of a pessimist. Uh, for me, I always think that I can fit... Uh, any, limit, uh, any unlimited amount of things into any particular space uh, might be space on my calendar in terms of how I book myself up with things. Uh, sometimes even include space in my stomach in terms of how much I think I can gather and pile into my plate and get in there. Uh, it's one of those funny things about optimism. You always think that you can get a lot more done than you actually can. And sometimes that means that I'm often uh, underestimating uh, the barriers and the challenges in front of me, uh, you know, particularly, you know, maybe it's trying to get the kids somewhere on time. And I always think, oh, I've got plenty of time. And uh, of course, you know, something happens, kids, kid needs to, to get to the bathroom, whatever it is, and suddenly you're 10 minutes late. I don't know, some parents might be able to empathize with that. Uh, it often happens to me that I look outside at the weather and I check the forecast and I even check the radar sometimes and look at it and go, oh yeah, it'd be great, good time to go to the park, only to find that I'm absolutely drenched in rain 
when I get there. Now, that's uh, part of being an optimist, but what about pessimists? You know, optimists always see the positive side of things, uh, always believing good things will happen. Uh, pessimists, well, pessimism is not necessarily a worse state. It's, in fact, in, in some ways, as my wife constantly reminds me, uh, pessimists tend to be a little bit more grounded in reality. Right? A little bit more wary of risks and dangers, uh, more likely to recognise limits and restrictions. Uh, pessimists, you know, the pessimist says, uh, this is a great quote I heard, the pessimist says, I hate optimists. They jump out of a plane expecting sunshine and rainbows to cushion their fall. Meanwhile, I'll look both ways before crossing the street and get hit by the optimist. Uh, isn't that just the pessimist kind of frame of mind there? Um, it's important. Now, the important thing actually is not whether you're a optimist or a pessimist, but how aligned you are to reality. You see, the realist is able to plan carefully, to persist through the challenges, to choose the right strategies that are needed, to put the effort in, to push through, and to recognise what's real and what's there. And both pessimists and optimists can be kind of prone to straying from that reality in different directions. You said that the pessimist sees a dark tunnel, the optimist sees the light at the end of the tunnel, the realist sees a freight train, and the train driver sees three fools standing on the tracks. <laughs> well, church, we come to Jeremiah chapter 29, okay? And we've seen that Israel has been delivered a major reality check. We've seen that there are people who are going into exile. Uh, God has promised this. He has said that this is uh, part of... Uh, we just go back a slide there, Steve. Um, they have uh, going into exile as judgment for their wayward hearts, for the ways that God cheated on... Uh, the ways that they cheated on God by straying after useless idols, uh, the, the way that uh, they have completely rebelled against everything that God told them that they were supposed to be. But in Jerusalem, there are those who remain in a level of optimism. That is, there are those who are there thinking, oh, this is going to be a short exile. This is all going to be over soon. Well, Jeremiah's got a real message that is about making a major reality check, about saying, well, maybe the exile isn't going to be short. In fact, God is promising that the exile will not be short. And so the question that Israel are wrestling, and the question that is going to be so helpful and relevant for us is this question, how do we live in the midst of the harsh realities of life? You see, think about what it means to be in exile. It means that you have been conquered. Your people have been sent out from homes and businesses and you're now living in a foreign country, in a foreign place, uh, foreign customs, trying to make a new life and you don't have any of the things that you were used to. That's the message. This is the letter to those exiles, to those people who are now living in Babylon. So you read with me verse 1. It's the context. This is, this is the text of the letter that the prophet Jeremiah sent from Jerusalem to the surviving elders among the exiles and to the priests. The prophets and all the other people Nebuchadnezzar had carried into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. This was after King, Jeho King Jehoiachin and the Queen Mother, the court officials and the leaders of Judah and Jerusalem, the skilled workers and the artisans had gone into exile from Jerusalem. Now, I don't know how many of your families might have been refugees at some point. Uh, that is a, uh, it's a, it's a really hard thing. In fact, Bonnie's parents were forced out of Vietnam because of the war. And what I've gathered is that most refugees don't actually really want to talk about that experience. You know, the level of trauma that happens when you have lost everything, homes, businesses, family, having family now scattered across the world in lots of different places, now, Bonnie's parents are fortunate to be taken in by Australia and built a new life here. And this is what God commands the exiles to do. Build houses, settle down. Verse 4. This is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says to all those are carried into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Build houses and settle down. Plant gardens and eat what they produce. Marry and have sons and daughters. Find wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage so that they too may have sons and daughters. Increase in number there. Do not decrease. Also, seek the peace and prosperity of the city to which I have carried you into exile. 
Pray to the Lord for it, because if it prospers, you too will prosper. So you can kind of get the vibe of what it, uh, Jeremiah is saying. He's saying, hey, exiles, you might be out there in Babylon, but the message is, settle down. This is not, you're not going to come back here anytime soon. Build houses, get on with your life. But that last little bit might be a little bit disconcerting too, wouldn't it? Like actually seek the good of the city that you're now in. That is seeking the good of the people who conquered you, who took your homes and took your family. To actually want to see them prosper. See, there's a few messages going on here. Number one is that they're going to be there for a while. So you may as well settle down and make the most of the situation that's there. But number two is that this is all of God's doing. You see, there'll be people within Israel who'll be thinking, well, I'm not just going to sit here and do nothing. I'm going to fight back. I'm going to rebel. And this is my chance to, to, to kind of start an insurrection, take the empire down from the inside. But that's not the message that God gives them. God says, this is part of your punishment. This is part of your judgment. So don't fight it. Don't struggle it. Accept the realities that God has given you. Accept these circumstances and make the best of that situation. Live normally. Be part of Babylonian society. Build houses. Raise families. Don't descend into depression and wither and die. Don't go to war. But don't also live in some kind of optimistic dreamland that this is going to be short and just be over in a matter of months or years. In actual fact, God says this is going to take... 70 years. But the thing is, within Israel, there are those who keep saying, no, this is going to be short. God surely will bring us back from this very soon. You see that there in verse 8. Yes, this is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel says. Do not let the prophets and diviners among you deceive you. Do not listen to the dreams you encourage them to have. They are prophesying lies to you in my name. I have not sent them, declares the Lord. See, what's going on is that there are people, that the people themselves are looking for prophets, people who will bring them good news, people who will bring them a picture that that they're going to be uh, reunited with their families, they're going to have the land back, and it's only going to be a short matter of time. You see, I reckon uh, it's just a human thing to be really drawn towards big, grand, blind promises, promises of hope, promises of uh, good things for you, promises of getting rich quickly. Yeah, I'm always surprised by the scams that people fall for. You know, it's like, oh, the ATO left you a message, you owe them 500 bucks, better call back, better better send that money back before the feds get on to you. Or even worse, the Nigerian prince who has millions of dollars locked up, send a few hundred dollars our way and we'll help and you can take a part in that. Right, you almost think, no, no one would fall for that. And yet, statistically, statistically, Australians are losing, are losing hundreds of millions of dollars every year to scams just like this. You see, that blind kind of optimism, that hope, we are just drawn to that. We want that. And we will be easily scammed by that too. But God's message to the exiles in Babylon is 70 years. 70 years of exile. 70 years before God will come and do something about it. Read on with me, verse 10. This is what the Lord says. When 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will come to you and fulfill my good promise to bring you back to this place. For though I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you a hope and a future. Now, you might recognize that verse 11 there. I think it's probably, uh, it might be one of the most misquoted verses in the Bible. It's the kind of thing that looks really nice on a nice little kind of poster with a nice background that kind of uh, gives you a, what I call it, it's it's a kind of a uh, sentimental Christian optimism, right? It gives you one picture of God, that is a God who is there for your good. He wants good things for you. He has good plans for you. And it feels good. It's very alluring. But you also read there in those verses that that's completely out of context, isn't it? Because what are the other plans that God has for Israel? 70 years in exile. You see, yes, there is a God who wants good things for you. There is a God who loves you. 
But there is also a God who is just. There is a God who punishes sin. There is a God who is willing to send us pain and suffering that might be even for our good, that might grow us, might discipline us, might teach us something in the pain. And sometimes I think, you know, we can get really drawn into the consumer Christianity trap. That is, all of what church and God is about is about meeting my comfort, my needs, and my needs for a future and a plan and and good things to happen to me. And I want God to fulfill all of those things for me. But actually, what do we see here is that God is in charge. He will send the good and he will send the bad. And there are times when God might send us more sorrow than joy. But what does God want for this people, for these people in exile? Well, part of the exile is actually supposed to turn Israel back to him. What God is seeking is for a people who would recognize their failure, who would recognize their sin, and they would come and they would cry out to God, that they would recognize and realize that they have nothing left to stand on apart from God. Verse 12, then you will call on me and come and pray to me and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. I will be found by you, declares the Lord, and will bring you back from captivity. I will gather you from all the nations and the places that I have banished you, declares the Lord, and will bring you back to the place which I carried you into exile. See, church, I reckon the person of faith recognizes that sometimes We've got to accept reality from God's hand. And that reality might not be all pleasant clouds and dreams and rainbows. Sometimes that reality might be hard. That moment when your plans are destroyed and thrown out the window, your dreams crushed, your family fall apart, your health disintegrate, the brain cancer, incurable brain cancer, disseminates through your brain. And the message here to the exiles and to us, is don't run, don't hide, don't blame God. Don't go seeking after alternative saviours, whether it's retail therapy or TV, chocolate or video games. God may be calling us back to him, calling us to our knees in utter dependence on him, crying out from our heart, our heart's lament of our situation, that we might realise how bankrupt we are, that we might realise that our only hope is in God. You see, the little poster that kind of talks about a vague picture of God wanting good things for us doesn't nearly capture the way that God works. Now, God, in fact, does want good for them, and he does promise them, and he does say that he will bring them back. It's something concrete. It says there is a hope that is put out for them, that this will not be forever. But friends, this was supposed to be a wake-up call, a wake-up call to Israel. A wake-up call for them to turn from their ways, for the way that they just continue living on their ways as though nothing was wrong, as though they're just kind of blindly hoping that prosperity is just around the corner. Meanwhile, they can consistently turn their hearts from God. You know, next week we'll uh, begin our series, Rebuild, Restore, Reform, and we actually get to track the the story of uh, of how Israel does get brought back from exile in, uh, in, in Babylon. But today I actually wanted to ask a question for us. How do we go at facing hard realities? You know, if you are the optimist, you just want to see the good and the opportunity and everything and sometimes gloss over actually that there is something hard going on. Well, that God might be trying to teach you something right now. Or if you're the pessimist, you might notice all the hard things and take them to heart and be burdened by them. But without the picture of hope that God offers us. See, I think this chapter is a call to accepting the reality of whatever reality God gives us. The God who brings the good stuff and the hard stuff. The God who brings joys and who brings sorrows. The God who will never abandon us, no matter what situation you find yourself in. 
You see, this real bleak moment in the history of this nation and the history of this people uh, looks forward, really, to a great hope. As Israel called to face the reality of the exile with courage, God promises that he has not abandoned them and that he will give them a hope and a future. But friends, it's not just sort of vague, sentimental hope, but actually, a few hundred years later, the man Jesus Christ led the return from exile. Not just the return to exile for Israel, but for all of humanity. You see, actually all of humanity, the entire race of humanity lives in exile. We no longer live in the land and the garden that God gave us to live in. We all live in a broken and a fallen and a sick world. A world in which we will get sick, where things will happen, relationships will break, where life will be hard, where we will face depression, anxiety, trauma, difficulty. This is the world we live in. And the more that we can face that reality, the more we can understand what God might be doing in, and in this moment in time, in the present. But friends, there is also a hope and a future. And God has shown us this through his son. That just as Israel had to go through 70 years of judgment and exile, what do we see? We see a man upon a cross bearing the judgment for the sins of the world. You know, Paul the Apostle puts it like this in uh, Romans chapter 8, my favourite chapter of the Bible. Okay, it says this, If God is for us, who could be against us? Who could do not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all? How will he not also along with him graciously give us all things? For I am convinced that neither death nor life, nor angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. See, friends, God's message here is that his plans and the future and the hope that we have has actually come to fruition in Christ for all of us, for all who would put their trust in him. Now, friends, that won't magically take the pain away that you might be experiencing right now. But when you start to understand that that suffering may be part of God's plan, we we can begin to turn to God, crying out in pain and trusting ourselves to a God who has locked our future in with Christ. See, at that point, we can start to face both the hard reality of the present and be hopeful about the future because of God's promises in the past. Uh, struggling here. I can go back a couple of slides there. Great. You see, I think that's the message of this chapter, and this is what we, we need to take from that. It's the way that we face the realities that we're in, the way that we can face suffering because of what God has given us already in Christ. We can cry out to him. We can call to him. In fact, he calls us to do that in Christ. And church, you know, I don't know everyone. See, I don't know everyone's story. But I do know this. I do know that right now there are a number of people here who are walking those dark tunnels, those hard moments, who are really struggling to see where the light is. And if that's you... I'm going to ask you to keep turning your eyes to what Jesus has promised us in Christ. Now, Elizabeth Elliot, uh, she was a missionary who lost her husband very early on in their, in their missionary uh, journeys. Uh, this is what she said about her suffering. This is, the deepest things that I have learned uh, in my own life have come from the deepest suffering. And out of the deepest waters and the hottest fires have come the deepest things that I know about God. You see, there is something that God may be doing in us and through us to actually help us to know him better, to actually understand more of what it means that we have the God who loves us and cares for us. You know, this week I've been reading this story about a woman who has had a very difficult life. Uh, She was born with uh, some, uh, yeah, she was born with some conditions that actually meant that she uh, spent most of her childhood in hospital, 13 surgeries. Uh, When she finally made it out and into school, she faced a lot of bullying for the way she looked. 
She then suffered multiple miscarriages in her adult life and then further on chronic pain and debilitating disease in her midlife. I just wanted to read to you some of her reflections because I think she reflects on this stuff really well. That's what she said to say. So what do we know that we should focus on in reference to suffering? What we do know with rock solid, uh, what do we know with rock solid certainty? We know that the entire world is under God's control. We know that God loves us enough to send his son to die in our place. We know that if a sovereign God who tenderly loves us permits suffering in our lives, he must have a purpose. We know that he who tells the ocean how far it can come will not let us suffer any longer than necessary. Since we know God has a purpose in suffering, we can be sure that our trials will accomplish something invaluable both in us and through us. While the specific reasons for any suffering are a mystery, we can know that when we lean into God and not away from him in our pain, we can glimpse part of what he's doing. This is what I've learned through those glimpses. God uses suffering to deepen our faith and draw us closer to him. In pain, we suffer more earnestly because we need God's help. We read the Bible more intentionally because we need to hear God's voice. We ask and seek more consistently because we're desperate. And when we do that, we find the Lord's assurances throughout Scripture. Our love for God can be weak in times of prosperity. Our thoughts focus on the things we want. But in suffering, our thoughts are riveted on God. When our dreams disintegrate, we begin to long for something more lasting. It is there that we find Jesus and realize that he is more valuable, more precious, more fulfilling than anything he can give us. He is our greatest gift. Your suffering will end. Your pain will not last forever. But as you wait, God is deepening your faith, refining your character and encouraging others to trust him by your example. Don't waste your suffering, for it will be the making of your faith. God is using it in a thousand ways you may never see in this life. But one day... When your faith becomes sight, you'll be grateful for them all. See, friends, that's a picture of the person of faith who understands suffering and understands the ways that it helps us understand everything about God, about faith, about depending on the world and the the world's goods and our dreams and our hopes. And the one who can trust God in every circumstance, that he may be doing the work the very work that we need right now to draw us to him. And church, so I don't know all of what you're going through right now, but I'm going to pray to a God who does know, to a God who cares, and a God who has set us great, great promises in Christ. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, Lord, we come to you, crying out to you, calling out to you with heavy hearts, knowing that many among us have suffered, are suffering, or will suffer in the near future, great difficulty and pain. But Father, we also trust that you are a God who is in charge, that you are a God who does indeed look out for our good, and that we know that in concrete terms, because you sent your son to die for us bearing the punishment for judgment and sin upon himself, that we might have a future and a hope in him. And Father, we ask that as we face suffering, whether it's now or into the future, might our hearts be turned to you and not away from you, that we might learn what you want to teach us, that we might yearn and look forward in hope, trusting in the only solid hope that we have, Jesus Christ our Lord, and in his name we pray these things. Amen.